The British Empire lasted over 300 years. It made Britain the most powerful nation in history. It also shaped a fundamental part of the British character. The empire offered the inhabitants of a grey, damp island in the North Atlantic the prospect of limitless adventure. You might discover a diamond field and become unimaginably rich, or you might perish in a malarial swamp. Either way, the thing to do was to play up, play up, and play the game. Wherever the flag was planted went a passion for sport and the spirit of fair play. Yes, 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 yes. But sport was about more than just good, clean fun. It was an entire way of looking at the world. And it was one of the foundations of the empire. In its wide open spaces, a particular kind of British hero was born. Exploring the unknown places of the earth, hungry for glory and adventure, courageous, intrepid, and ruthless. For the builders of empire, it was how you played the game that mattered more than victory, mattered more than life itself. To Britons in the mid-19th century, the heart of Africa was as mysterious and unexplored as the dark side of the moon. It proved a magnet for Victorian adventurers. They were drawn by an obsession to get there first and to put new names to new places. On the 17th of June, 1857, two Englishmen arrived in East Africa. Their names were Richard Burton and John Hanning Speak. They dreamed of finding what had eluded explorers for millennia. Where did the most famous river in civilization begin? What was the source of the Nile? The two men could hardly have been more different. Burton was 36 and already famous as a charismatic adventurer, a man who'd smuggled himself into Mecca disguised as an Arab, a man known for liking to charm snakes and wrestling alligators, a man who would eventually learn to speak 29 languages. He had a slightly sinister expression to his face, which wasn't helped by a scar on each cheek where a javelin had pierced right through his face. But it was the eyes that everyone remembered. One poet described them as having a look of unspeakable horror. His companion was his complete opposite. John Hanning Speak was clean living with a taste for tweed suits. But he shared with Burton the cast of mind that made the early pioneers of empire, an obsessive, often foolhardy determination.
The pair came to loathe each other and would become bitter rivals. Together they traveled over 1,500 miles through swamp, desert and jungle. For two years they journeyed into the interior, battling dysentery, fever and wild animals, scorched by the tropical sun. You get a sense of how heroic this expedition was when you look at this 19th century map of Africa. They had landed on the east coast and various places around here, Madagascar, Zanzibar, Mozambique and so on. They are known. But inside Africa, the whole heart of Africa is just marked unknown parts, thousands upon thousands of square miles. But somewhere in there was the source of the Nile. When Burton went down with malaria, Speak pressed on alone. And on the morning of August the 3rd, 1858, a year after they had set out, John Hanning Speak looked out on a vast expanse of water, which he immediately, of course, named Lake Victoria and which he believed to be the source of the Nile. I no longer felt any doubt, he wrote, that the lake at my feet gave birth to that river whose source has been the object of so many explorers. It was no more than a hunch, though as it later turned out, he was right. Despite the fact his evidence was really pretty thin, Speak hastened back to camp and six weeks later was reunited with Burton. I found the source of the Nile, he told him, to which Burton replied, oh no, you haven't. The two men agreed it would just be safest not to talk about it anymore. And for the remainder of their time in the jungle, they maintained a frosty English silence on the subject. Victorian explorers like Speak and Burton were the pathfinders of empire, fanatical not for power, but for knowledge and excitement. And they helped to create the image of the classic British hero. Their accounts of their travels inspired tales of adventure for a British public hungry for excitement. King Solomon's Mines was published in 1885 and was a huge bestseller. Filmed many times since, it tells the story of three British adventurers who play the game to the hilt. Together they cross Africa in search of the lost diamond mines of an ancient civilization. King Solomon's Mines. Its author, Henry Ryder Haggard, was an old colonial. He'd spent seven years in Southern Africa. The British public devoured his thrilling tale of danger and exploration. It came complete with a map of his hero's journey into the unknown. It's written in blood a very good start, on a strip of fabric torn from a dying man's shirt. 
and it shows the route you have to take across the Kalakawe River, avoiding the bad water between a couple of mountains called uh, Sheba's Breasts to the idols guarding the cave where the treasure is. In this quiet country house in Norfolk, Ryder Haggard produced rip-roaring yarns for generations of schoolboys to read under the bedclothes, as well they might. His massively popular tale, She, comes with a powerful dash of Victorian male fantasy. She, or she who must be obeyed, is an African goddess, white as it happens, made immortal by killing her lovers. The narrator is at last allowed a peep at her extravagant charms. For a moment, she stood still, her hands raised high above her head, and as she did so, the white robe slipped from her down to her golden girdle, bearing the blinding loveliness of her form. I mean, this is enough to burst the buttons on your Victorian waistcoat, but what it does point up is the way in which the empire opened up the possibility of all sorts of intoxications that were quite unknown in respectable old England. For Ryder Haggard's heroes, the empire was a vast playground for a particular kind of British male. He's a fellow with a stiff upper lip, athletic and unpretentious. He is fair, he is honest and he's steady. He's an amateur and you can find him all over the empire from Khartoum to Calcutta to Cape Town. If you needed three words to sum him up, a decent chap. The decent chap was a contradiction. Sturdy and self-reliant, yet ready to obey orders without hesitation. He was nurtured in a place far removed from the heat and dust of the colonies, the English public school. The public school's heyday was the height of the Victorian era. Schools like this took boys and turned them into the governing class of empire, the future prefects of the colonial world. They couldn't expect an easy ride. Life in a Victorian public school was specifically designed to work against the comforts of family life. The chief thing to be desired, said one headmaster, is to remove the child from the noxious influence of home. There was a good reason for this strict regime. It was to make the boys Christian gentlemen, manly and enlightened, finer specimens of human nature than any other country could furnish. The words of rugby's celebrated headmaster, Thomas Arnold. This is the room known as Upper Bench, where Dr. Arnold taught some of the sons of the wealthier Victorian middle class. But from what they were taught, you would never guess that Victorian scientists, engineers, architects and explorers were about to forge the modern world. It 
was rather the ancient Romans who provided the model. Victorian headmasters and politicians didn't look forward, but back to the classical world in which civilization was spread at the point of the sword. This is a timetable from 1899, and it shows that if you were a 16-year-old in the upper middle part of the school, this would be what you'd study. Divinity, classics, 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 classics. Maths, natural science, classics, maths, classics, 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 classics. French, history, French, maths, classics, 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 maths, classics. Small wonder that as one visitor to another public school remarked, not one boy in 10 could tell him where Birmingham was. But a public school education wasn't really about learning where Birmingham was. A particular idea of Christian values, discipline, respect for rules and ritual, these made up the public school's true mission, the moulding of character. But there was something else fostered here that would prove an even more powerful builder of empire. The British public school practiced two religions, Christianity and sport. According to one Victorian headmaster, sport was the rock on which Britain's greatness was built. Englishmen, he said, are not superior to Frenchmen or Germans in brains or industry or the science or applications of war. In the history of the British Empire, it is written that England owes her sovereignty to her sports. The values of organized games were said to express the values of empire. Physical courage, Team spirit and uh, having a go. And it was the game of cricket which gave rise to one of the most famous of all famous empire poems. There's a breathless hush in the close tonight, ten to make and the match to win, a bumping pitch and a blinding light, an hour to play and the last man in. And it's not for the sake of a ribboned coat or the selfish hope of a season's fame, but his captain's hand on his shoulder smote. Play up, play up, and play the game. In the poem, the scene shifts from the cricket field to a bloody battle in the African desert. The schoolboy is now a soldier, his comrades in arms dead or dying all around him. But then his spirit soar as he hears his captain's voice calling, play up, play up and play the game. It's majestic, and it's idiotic at the same time, to our eyes at least, because war isn't a game. And yet the fact that the poem could be written in that way tells us something rather profound about the way that the British viewed their empire. The battle which had inspired the poem was fought by British troops in the biggest country in Africa, Sudan. 
In such remote outposts, the heroes of empire achieved sometimes mythical status. In 1884, the Empire found a hero who played the game with a passion that bordered on madness. He was a soldier who showed that heroic failure could be even more inspiring than victory. Charles Gordon was a maverick, a general who disobeyed orders and wrote his own. He became an imperial martyr in one of the strangest episodes in the history of empire, the siege of Khartoum. The capital was surrounded by thousands of Islamic warriors, followers of a religious leader sworn to end British rule. He called himself the Mahdi, the expected one. The man sent from Britain to stop the Mahdi, roared on by the London newspapers, was already a legendary soldier and a fervent Christian. General Charles George Gordon was an extraordinary man. He was thin, he was 51, he was unmarried, and he had blue eyes with a faraway look in them. Other places they just have called him a crank, but as it was, the British public, whipped up by the press, came to share his unshakable self-belief. General Gordon could save Khartoum. Gordon's orders weren't to fight, but to evacuate the British force there. But Gordon himself had something rather more heroic in mind. From the governor's palace, he announced he'd hold out against the Mahdi until reinforcements were sent. The siege of the city began. The British government, furious with Gordon's disobedience, refused to act. The press were outraged at this treatment of their hero. Gordon had been deserted, they cried. He must be rescued. General Gordon was a hero, not just because he was a remarkable human being, but because he seemed to express Britain's moral purpose. The newspapers twigged that in a way that the Prime Minister, William Gladstone, didn't. Gladstone didn't want a war, but the press and public opinion forced his hand. The army hastily assembled a relief force, but by now it was too late. After 10 months under siege, every scrap of food in Khartoum had been eaten. The dead lay in the streets, the Mahdi's men were at the gates. The water level of the Nile protecting the city dropped further every day. Holed up in the governor's palace, Gordon was relishing the part he'd given himself in this imperial tragedy. He lit candles in his rooms, almost offering himself as a target to the Mahdi's snipers. A companion begged him to stop. When God was portioning out fear to the people of the world, he told him, at last, it came to my turn, and there was no fear left to give me. Go tell all the people of Khartoum that Gordon fears nothing, because God has created him without fear. When the attack came, it was unbelievably savage. 
The siege had lasted 317 days. It ended in a bloodbath. Gordon was killed in the battle. The Mahdi's followers brought him Gordon's head as a trophy. The general's body was never found. Khartoum and the Sudan belonged to the Mahdi. The Mahdi's great-grandson still lives in the city. Ah, good morning, good morning, good morning. Ah, good morning, Imam, good morning. Thank you for having us. What sort of a man was your great-grandfather? The Mahdi was a world-denying figure. Although he wanted to change the world, he really wanted to change it in favor of the next world. So actually he was a world denying, almost the aspirations of a mystic. Whatever kingdom he had in mind is a kingdom in heaven, not here. When you think about it, they're really pretty similar individuals, aren't they? I mean, they're both uh, religious. Yes, they were yes. both ascetic men. They yes, both, yes, yes. Gordon too was a man who Indeed. mortified the flesh and Indeed. denied the world. Indeed. And he was a great hero in, in Britain in the way that the Mahdi was a popular hero here. Indeed, that's why there is this uh, tragedy, mm. that there was this conflict between people who, in a world differently organized, could have been very close friends. What do you feel about General Gordon? He had no business combating people who were asserting themselves. The whole basis is that power corrupts. And if you have power, it's very difficult for you to accept other human beings as your equal because you feel that the very uh, powerful situation makes you some kind of god. Then you make the rules, then you make the uh, everything, you decide everything. And this, of course, is a great human failing. If General Gordon had only done as he was told and evacuated Khartoum, he'd never have become the imperial hero he immediately turned into, even though he'd have saved thousands of lives, his own included. The people of Britain didn't much care whether or not Sudan was in the British Empire, but this wasn't about a place. It was about an idea. That idea was summed up in the famous painting Gordon's Last Stand by George W. Joy. Gordon waits at the top of the steps, careless in the face of death. He makes no attempt to defend himself. His pistol hangs loosely in his hand. His sword remains sheathed. He looks his killers in the eye. Do what you have to do. This wasn't the death of an imperial conqueror. This was a martyrdom, sanctifying the empire with heroism and personal sacrifice. The memory of Gordon's solitary end refused to fade. Even after the death of the Mahdi, the British public and the British press continued to thirst for revenge. The task fell to a man of a very different kind from Charles Gordon. Even by his own men, Sir Horatio Herbert Kitchener was often described as a man with no soul. The Daily Mail dubbed him the machine of the Sudan.
On the 1st of January 1897, a meticulously organized force left Egypt for Khartoum, over 600 miles to the south. The British force advanced steadily across the desert, laying a railway line behind it at the amazing rate of a mile and a half a day. On the train which followed came guns and troops and supplies, and three gunboats which had been built on the Thames, disassembled and shipped up here to be put back together on the banks of the Nile. It was a relentless progress. This was a new kind of warfare, the moment the empire entered the machine age. Waiting in Khartoum were the Sudanese warriors, the dervishes, sometimes known as whirling dervishes after their ecstatic religious dance. Dervishes still gather on holy days in Khartoum to pray, celebrate, and dance. The great poet of empire, Rudyard Kipling, wrote about them in the imagined words of an ordinary British soldier who recognized that in some strange foreign way, the dervishes too played up played up and played the game. Kipling's soldier raises an imaginary glass to his fearless foe. So here's to you, fuzzy wuzzy, at your home in the Sudan. You're a poor, benighted heathen, but a first-class fighting man. The dervishes might play the game in the old-fashioned way, but the empire had moved on. Kitchener would rely on rather more than fighting spirit to win in battle. The British like to think of their military history in events like the Spanish Armada or the Battle of Britain, when outnumbered and outgunned, Britain survived by virtue of guts and ingenuity. But the truth is that in most of Britain's empire wars, Britain's inventiveness in science and industry had simply given it much better ways of killing people. On Kitchener's desert train had come machine guns and thousands of rounds of ammunition. At Omdurman, near Khartoum, the stage was set for one of the bloodiest battles in the history of empire. The British forces were drawn up down by the Nile over there and the Mahdi's men held the high ground. Winston Churchill was a young officer with Kitchener and he described coming out one morning and seeing the entire hillside moving. Thousands upon thousands of dervishes advancing on a front he reckoned was four miles wide under innumerable banners and with the sun glinting on the tips of their spears. Spears against machine guns. The result was never in doubt. Kitchener was watching the battle from horseback. At about 11.30, so five hours after the fighting began, he put his binoculars away and remarked that the enemy seemed to have been given a good dusting. They then broke for lunch. The casualties were about 10,000 Sudanese dead to 48 British.
the body of General Gordon's foe, the Mahdi, was dug up and thrown into the Nile. Kitchener was presented with the Mahdi's skull as a trophy of war. The story went that he planned to use it as an inkstand. Queen Victoria was not amused. Ornamental skulls weren't her idea of fair play, even if Kitchener had added a million square miles to her empire. Where Gordon had failed, Kitchener had succeeded spectacularly. But it wasn't Kitchener, the machine of the Sudan, who became the empire's romantic hero. That role belonged to Charles George Gordon, idealistic, reckless and slightly deranged and now very dead. That was how the empire really liked their heroes. Heroic disaster always seemed to stir British hearts quite as much as victory. Whether it was the explorer Captain Cook killed by Hawaiian islanders in 1779, or Sir John Franklin, frozen to death trying to find the Northwest Passage through the Arctic. Or the charge of the Light Brigade riding fearlessly and pointlessly into enemy cannon fire in the Crimea. They all played up, played up, and played the game. Tales of heroism provided spectacular stories for the citizens of what was soon calling itself the mother country. Publishers were churning them out well into the 20th century. One of the main outlets for this kind of material would have been the market of Sunday school prizes, um, giving things as gifts to good spellers in class. Mm. The Romance of Colonization. Wouldn't be a title of a book that you'd see today, I don't think you would see that very often now. Wow, there are loads of them. I think it very much reflects the way that mm. people saw the world and, you know, one of the major elements was, of course, Britishness, patriotism, mm. excitement in the empire. And I think the, mm. the striking thing is certainly the message of the text, which is this is all about bringing civilization to benighted parts of the world, but then just the glorious and, and alluring images Society was awash with this kind of comic or cigarette card collection, annuals. Because a lot of people would find all this stuff unspeakable now, wouldn't they? Ghastly racist propaganda. I think it tells us a lot about the worldview of the time. It's also interesting in magazines like Chums. There were so many of these. Chums, what a great name. Dozens and the mercy dozens of the of witch titles. doctors. This one, of course, is full of militaristic heroism of the British armed forces and, of course, the standard themes about English history and the wider world and the empire. A fight with the Zulus. Um, here, for example, there are copies of the wider world, which, uh, to all intents and purposes, is very much the same stuff yet again. When you start looking in the magazine and you get adverts for Canadian Club whiskey or <laughs> Burlington Belt trusses or briar pipes, that you realise the target audience. Chap who needs a truss is going to be damn all use in some of these situations. <laughs> Such tales might satisfy the armchair imperialist at home, but out in the colonies, playing the game was something to be done more energetically. For the British, sport was part of the civilizing mission of empire. The gift of the mother country to her colonies. Whether it involved chasing a ball, smashing it with a racket, or whacking it with a club. The sporting gospel was carried to the farthest flung corners of the empire.
Hong Kong's life as a British colony began in the 1840s as a trading post for nearby China. Even here, there was always a place for one of the empire's great obsessions, horse racing. They used to say that when the French took a colony, they built a restaurant. When the Germans took one, they built a road. And when the British pitched up, they built a race course. Happy Valley Racecourse in the heart of Hong Kong is a legacy of the days of empire. Over 20,000 people come here every Wednesday night. It was the British who developed the razzmatazz of the modern turf. Today's inhabitants are such enthusiastic gamblers that bookies here take as much money in one night as in the whole of Ascot week. I'm going with number seven, something special in the next one. Let's find out what the minimum bet is. Can I have $10? It's about a pound, I think. $10 on something special, number seven in the 810. You? Number seven, right? Number seven, something special. which is about just over three quid. <laughs> We're not even going to get a round of drinks out of it. Wherever in the empire sport was played, it was supposed to bind subject peoples to their colonial masters. But the spirit of fair play and the interests of empire would eventually clash head on. The West Indian island of Jamaica had been a British colony since 1655. The British introduced cricket to Jamaica in the 1830s. It soon seemed to enter the bloodstream of the island. He's got a good eye, that boy in the yellow shirt, hasn't he? How old are you? Ten. Ten? You play much cricket? Who's the best cricketer here? You are. are you? Not him. Who's the best? You're the best cricketer, are you? Me. You're the best one. I am. I am. I am. You're the two champs. But there was a problem here. 
How could a game which prided itself on fairness work in an empire divided between rulers and ruled, and therefore very obviously unfair? Cricket in the West Indies would become not a unifying force, but a symbol of oppression. In 19th century Jamaica, whites owned the land, blacks worked on it. While cricket was supposed to be good for subject races, at that time, black and white rarely played together. It's a practice day at Sabina Park, the home of Jamaica's Kingston Cricket Club. When it was formed in 1863, it was a place for white men to play the game. Even when black and white began to play on the same side, racial tensions in the game remained. No black player was ever selected to captain the national team. Whites were chosen to bat, while blacks were relegated to bowling or fielding. It wasn't quite the done thing for white men to do a lot of running around in the tropics, and besides which there was a distinction between brawn, bowling, and brains, batting. Batting was for white men. Change had to come. It arrived in the person of Frank Worrell, who in 1960 became the first black player to captain the West Indies team for an entire series. When Worrell brought his team to England, they showed they could play the game rather better than their hosts. The old ball can never have known a scene like this. Victory in the series by three matches to one confirmed the West Indies as the most powerful side in the world. It was generally felt that here is the right person at last to lead a West Indies team because I think before there wasn't that unity based on who was appointed captain, who was appointed vice captain. Now it was felt that the players have a captain they can fight for. So I think it was greeted with cheers throughout the entire Caribbean, and I think many people are saying, at last, we have the right man to lead. It was like a Mandela moment. <laughs> it certainly was, that's why I said that. <laughs> free at last, free at last. Free at last, at last, at last. <laughs> the students now become the teachers. England taught the West Indies cricket. And it was a grand opportunity for the students now to reverse that process. And in the mind of many of the West Indian players, this was um, you know, the turning point, I think, for everyone. Um, sort of like sweet revenge. In the end, the British idea of fair play undermined the very notion of empire itself. If a black cricket captain, why not a black prime minister? In 1962, Jamaica became the first Caribbean island to gain independence. And through the 1960s, all over the empire, from the West Indies to Fiji, the Union Jack came down. As the empire crumbled, so did reverence for the things and attitudes it held dear. Everybody's doing a brand new dance now. Come on, baby, do the locomotion. I know you the uniforms, give it a chance now. Come the flag, the moustaches. This wasn't playing the game, this was having a laugh. A laugh at military valour, at sporting prowess, 
at the thrill of adventure and exploration. The empire was gone. The only way to cope with its loss was to see its absurdity. We'll be in to spank you later, you firm buttock young Amazons, you. I'm terribly sorry. I don't know what came over me. It's all right, Morrison. I think you'll know what to do. <laughs> yes. Except, of course, sir. <laughs> I apologize to you all. Now, why are these? Again. Why is this? Why is it funny? Because I, I think it's such an absurd thing that they're doing, and yet they're all taking it absolutely seriously. And and that's what the empire was all about, really, wasn't it? Doing very, very strange things, absolutely seriously. Clive, what are you doing? I say, Cooper, what's going on? Oh, uh, it's, it's nothing really, sir. Uh, he was just explaining. I was about... passing the port from left to right. And this sort of thin veneer of control, of which passing the port is one and being gallant about ladies is the other, you know, that, that's, if that starts to crack, the whole thing just collapses. And, and I think it's just because it's the formality of it. And, of course, the fact they're going to shoot themselves, which is the kind of ultimate logical end to letting down the empire. Where did the idea of ripping yarns come from? Well, really from all those books. It was, a, it was a literary idea. It was all those books that were written sort of in the 20s and 30s, and maybe before the war even, which I vaguely knew about, which were all stories of pluck, heroism, courage, duty. So why did you find it funny? Was it just because you were young and truculent? Well, when I started to think about this with, with the sort of clear light of the 60s upon us all, and we, suddenly we were free to, to talk about anything we wanted to, um, I suddenly thought, that, yes, it was. It was really absurd, and, <laughs> and it was a rich vein. And a lot of people kind of obviously shared that, that literary upbringing and, and understood, quite what we, understood what we were on about. What's funny is being funny in a place where you're not supposed to be funny. <laughs> So is all that's left of Empire just a bit of a joke? Not entirely. Hello, you boy in the corner there. You ought to be a boy scout. You're a fine looking fella and I know you'd make a jolly good backwoodsman by the look of you. You're ugly enough anyway. Robert baden pole founded the Boy Scouts in 1907. This die-hard imperialist wanted to enlist ordinary British boys to the service of the empire, not just the officer class of the great public schools. He gave them military-style uniforms and funny rituals, so these boys too could play up, play up and play the game. Today, the Scouts are going as strong as ever. Here at an annual camp in Norfolk, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts learn about living in the wild, oh, good. staying healthy, and becoming more confident. Baden-Pole had toyed with the idea of calling his organisation Young Knights of the Empire, but by the time I joined it, it had nothing to do with empire. What it fed on and continues to feed on is young people's appetite for adventure, for sleeping out, for cooking under the stars, for cleaning your teeth with a twig in a stream. Can I, jo can I jo join your breakfast? Yes. Yeah, sit down. Good. What do you think you learn in Scouts that you wouldn't learn somewhere else? It's just like some things you learn in school, like English and maths, but like you don't learn that at um, Scouts. It's like other things, like adventure and like other things that 
just might come in handy in life. You still do knots? Yeah, yeah, we yeah, do knots. Yeah. 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 He's got a bit of rope. You can all demonstrate your knots. Put your hand in there. Okay, go on. That's it. Very good. Can you let me out? <laughs> and do they still have that? You know the what was it called? The Scout Oath or the Scout Promise? promise. promise. Yeah. Promise, yes. And how does it go? I promise to do my best. God and the Queen. Queen. To help, help other people, people and to keep Scout law. Do you have a good deed every day? No? Sometimes. Are you supposed to help you... little old ladies across the road? No, they can do it themselves. <laughs> the Scout movement now numbers over 41 million boys and girls from North America to Europe to Africa. The Scouts were set up to protect the Empire from the fleshy corruption which Baden-Powell saw threatening it, but they've turned into something entirely different, international and inclusive, while still fostering the same spirits of self-reliance and public spiritedness. And here's two of them, I say. Next time, the Empire's roots, piracy in the Caribbean. Empire's riches, how it grew into a global money machine. And Empire's shame, profits from opium and slavery. To order a free Open University poster exploring the legacy of Britain's empire, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash empire or call 0845 366 8021. Jeremy Paxman's book, Empire, What Ruling the World Did to the British, is available. Storyville on BBC4 now looking behind the creativity of an expressionist painter. Who is Gorky?